The sky above Tokyo was doused in a hue of black and red, as the fiery inferno stretched higher and higher to obscure the stars in ash. The once calm and picturesque neighborhood of Sumida Ward had become the latest victim of super fortress payloads dropped over the capital in the U.S. military's war of attrition against the fascist imperial government of Japan, lasting for the length of World War II. Tens of thousands fled through the streets before the buildings above them were reduced to rubble, narrowly missing the piles of falling stones that would turn a house into a tomb. Amongst the throngs running headlong into a massive panic with what limited possessions they could muster was a family of four, led by a hard-working Chinese expatriate who owned a restaurant in Sumida, serving the dishes of his homeland to anyone who was hungry. Alongside him was his beautiful Japanese wife, who raised the kids while working diligently alongside her husband in the restaurant, a deeply benevolent and kind woman, which could be seen in her face along with a melancholy hidden behind the lid of her eye, the kind you only get when you lose a child. But if she could help it, she would not lose another. Not tonight. Trailing behind her were two boys, the elder of the two continuously looking behind him to make sure that his younger brother was keeping up. This younger boy, barely five years old, has already been through the ringer from birth. And he had many more trials ahead of him yet. Despite barely escaping death before he had even turned two, and the odds being stacked against the child, he was about to live one of the most exceptional lives anyone ever has. This is his tale. The King's Tale. I feel a certain sense of responsibility in telling this story. If you've been subscribed to this channel for a while, you know that the man we're talking about today was the first man to ever be featured on our series Global Baseball's Finest. And this particular series largely exists thanks to the response that video got. So many lovely stories about the greatest player in NPB history. Mythic yet grounded. Larger than life, but as approachable as a kindly shopkeep in a small town. And that video was about eight minutes long, talking about his swing for about a third of it. I left out so much. He deserves so much more than that. And that is what's brought me here. He is, in large part, the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. Why in one of the darker eras of baseball history, I looked outside my limited perspective and found a number. A big number. 868. A man who accomplished more than most players could possibly dream of in this game, and yet hardly anyone in the country where baseball was founded knows his name. Ever since then, world baseball has been my passion doing my own little part to bring the beauty of baseball around the world to new audiences, celebrating and venerating what makes it unique in Japan, Korea, Mexico, and Taiwan, just to name a few. And through it all, he has been there, as a legend, an ideal, a hero, urging me on as a player, a broadcaster, and a man. So this is it. Everything is built to this this arduous but thrilling journey to give the king his due. And if you're along for the ride, drop a like on the video. Let's me know you're out there. And be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when the next part of the story begins. Here we go, on the Global Baseball Network. The tale of Sadaharu O begins now. Sadaharu O was born Wang Cheng Chi on the 10th of May, 1940, alongside his twin sister, Hiroko O. His parents, Shifuku and Tomi, ran a small Chinese restaurant in the neighborhood that was quite popular, serving to a packed house most nights. This would ultimately cause Shifuku to get into trouble with the fascist government of the time, and because he kept his restaurant open past curfew to see to it that his regulars were well fed, even if they worked late, they suspected him of being a Chinese agent. He was, in reality, one of the many Taiwanese who emigrated for a better life after Chiang Kai-shek took over. Racism would eventually rear its ugly head for O himself a little further down the line in his young life, but he would end up facing substantial challenges even as an infant. Both he and his sister Hiroko were born with significant health problems, and Tomi, for the first year and a half of the twins' lives, ran the significant risk, according to the doctors, of losing both children before their first birthday. 
She worked diligently to tend to both their needs, giving them plenty of rest and comfort, feeding them as much as she could, just having to hope that the doctors were wrong. Fortunately for her, after several months of hard work, lost sleep, and plenty of prayer, it would prove that the doctors were indeed wrong. Partially. Hiroko would come down with the measles and succumb in August of 1941. After which, as you can imagine, Tomi was immensely sad. But to her great delight, Sadaharu seemed to turn a corner and begun to go stronger by the day, eventually beginning to grow happy and healthy. Such a powerful and early tragedy would change O's life, as it would anyone. But of all the physical and mental effects it caused, the most profound came from a belief his mother shared with him on one of the many mournful days that followed as he grew older. Hiroko took all her weak points with her. You should be grateful to your late sister, she said. This stuck with him for the rest of his life, and he says that he owes his recovery in large part thanks to the spirit of his sister working to make it so. Fortune, O believed, was an independent force that pulls everyone on earth this way and that at its discretion. And it would seem this primordial power imbued within the earth was about to take a keen interest in this young man. Hiroko's passing and his own subsequent recovery would be the first sign that, at the whim of fortune, Sadaharu's life was going to be far from ordinary. After the war, O's childhood resumed a semblance of normalcy. Following the firebombing that served as the opening for this video in 1945, the O family moved back to Sumida after a six-month sojourn in Yokohama and worked alongside their neighbors to help rebuild the neighborhood as the occupying Americans moved in. Growing up during the occupation, he, like many young kids at the time, became heavily entrenched in American culture. Funnily enough though, throughout this time, the first sport he had ever taken an interest in in watching on TV was not baseball, but sumo wrestling, catching matches in the National Sumo Stadium at Ryogaku, not far from the family home. The contempt that the Japanese people might have felt for the O's was only amplified by the occupying Americans. As they were Chinese, the family received a lot of goodies, treats, and extra rations and the like thanks to the soldiers paying extra attention to their needs over those of the Japanese. For a kid, this just simply looks like luck. And the hidden reason behind why this special treatment occurred would elude Sadaharu until he was a little older. On one occasion, on a ferry to Hokkaido, he and his family sat alone in a segregated cabin, with the Japanese huddling together, struggling for space, and the unoccupied subjects, the Chinese, on the other side, smack in the middle of empty seats. Shifuku, caring as he was, entreated the masses to come over the rope and sit in comfort, really using the space for their long, arduous journey. But chillingly, no one moved, and they simply stared back at them with blank looks on their faces. Through it all, his father and mother worked hard to put food on the table. Shifuku wanted the kids to grow up and take jobs that would allow them to follow in his footsteps, living every day to be useful to others. Specifically, he wanted Sadaharu to become an electrical engineer, and his older brother Tetsuharu to become a doctor. Choosing these two specific professions, because he believed they were the two specialists that the citizens of his village back in Taiwan needed most and did not have. He tasked Tetsujo with looking after his younger brother, hoping that valuable lessons would be taught, and the path that Tetsujo was on would rub off on him. Wary of the discipline their father would enforce when he found it necessary, the two brothers found time to bond over some frivolous things here and there. Chief among them was the passion Tetsujo imparted upon his brother on one of the many days where he was tasked with babysitting duty. My brother, he said one day, this is called the strategy of killing two birds with one stone. You are going to see some baseball. Your only obligation is to keep your mouth shut about it. Tetsujo was a star on the local sandlot team that played in amateur leagues against squads from the surrounding neighborhoods. Keeping it quiet from their parents, he brought young Sanaharu along to practice first to observe and then to act in a limited custodial capacity, cleaning up balls from the field and tending to the equipment during and after practices. One day, however, Tetsujo finally gave his younger brother a chance to hit. He stepped into the box, with a bat far too large for him to effectively use. 
gripping it with his right hand above his left, since left-handedness was viewed as a curse at the time, and, not knowing the rules, he figured that everyone had to bat right-handed. Most everyone had gone home, but there were still a few players left to watch Tetsujo pitch to his younger brother. He saw the ball coming his way, watching it all the way out of Tetsujo's hand. The bat began to move, and then suddenly... A clean rocket up the middle, and the rest, as they say, is history. One hit was all it took for the world of baseball to consume young Sadaharu O oh forever. He joined a Sandlot team of his own of neighborhood kids not long after, and fast became both the best hitter and pitcher on the team. Sadly, there was no room for him on his junior high's baseball team since it was over-enrolled, so he joined bigger and better Sandlot teams. As a middle schooler, he fielded a team so good, he challenged a group of adult factory workers at a bottle factory down the road from Sumida Junior High School for enough soda to satiate the thirst of his whole team. To the delight of the boys and a small gang of spectators that had gathered, Sadaharu's pitching carried the day, and news of the boys' victory spread rapidly. Still, he climbed up the ranks of the neighborhood leagues, and all the while Tetsujo went with him, and soon the O brothers were the talk of the town. Baseball ended up taking second fiddle to Tetsujo's career aspirations before long. After, at his father's wishes, he entered Keio University as a medical student. Though they are a member of Tokyo's Big Six, being a doctor does not necessarily lend itself well to the time commitments an athlete needs to make. But he formed a team of his fellow medical students to pass the time. Everything was going well until his ankle broke sliding into second base about a week before exams, and being laid up in a hospital does not work well for trying to effectively study. Shifuku's rage at this tomfoolery led to a lifetime ban for both O brothers from baseball. Tetsujo would continue on his path into medicine, and Sadaharu was to dedicate himself to the path of electrical engineering, as they had been so told since they were little boys. This, unsurprisingly, at least for Sadaharu, would not last long. The equipment was hidden, as were his comings and goings, so that his burgeoning baseball career could continue unabated. For a while, this system worked just fine. However, there was one thing that needed to be taken into account. Word of mouth. O's reputation had spread in the neighborhood, and Shifuku was regularly congratulated by passers-by at his son's sensational exploits on the Ward Baseball League diamond. Ever the gentleman, he smiled, thanked them politely, and concealed his rage as much as he could. Before long, though, he made up his mind. This was to end. It wouldn't matter if he had to yell, the boy would shape up, as if his life would depend on it. At the earliest opportunity, the discussion would need to be had, but first, a night of work. One night, after seeing to the customers who had come to the restaurant to sit down, he sallied forth to make some deliveries in nearby Asakusa. As he rode through the neighborhood, everyone seemed to be all up in arms about something. He couldn't quite figure out what, until he started hearing conversations about a frustrating young pitcher named Doe from the Umayon Cape Hearts, who was giving the Asakusa squad fits with both his bat and his fastball. Once he figured out where the field was, he was resolved. He marched over to the field, but before he could let his anger out, he did not see his insubordinate boy disobeying his will. He saw a young man, in the center of it all, at the top of his game, and this prodigy was his own son. Instead of an angry yell, he let out a cheer and watched Sadaharu play for the rest of the game before returning to work. When he returned home after his victory that night, Shifuku said nothing and let sleeping dogs lie. Sadaharu's baseball career, at least for now, was to continue. At the urging of a fortune teller, Sadaharu began seeing to it that wherever he went, an image of a dragon was always there to protect him. It was to do that much more to allow the ethereal arms of fortune to work their magic upon him as he went through life. They had already interceded once, saving his life and giving him a happy and healthy childhood. Now, however, it was time to clue the young Sadaharu in on what was to become his extraordinary future and it would be playing alongside these same Umayon Capehearts that on a November night in 1954, 
his life would once again change. The 30th of November, 1954 was, for all intents and purposes, a normal evening. Sanaharu had suited up for a Cape Hearts game against another local squad and things were going okay for the most part. He had already managed a hit and was pitching well into the third inning. The action on the field was lively as usual. The lights illuminated all the players, the dirt, the grass, and parts of the surrounding street, assisted by some street lamps littered about the general vicinity. At this hour of the night, a short, stocky man wearing a heavy jacket and a pair of tennis shoes, with a leash in his hand that led along his dog, slowly strode by. He stopped for a moment and turned to view the action. He was about a decade older than the participants in the game, but it was baseball, and baseball at any level, from t-ball to pro-ball, is captivating, especially for this particular stranger, as he had chosen to dedicate his life to it, and was for the moment at the top of his game. He was a big leaguer. He surveyed the field through the lenses of his thick, black spectacles, and the tall, athletic, half-Chinese kid hitting the ball hard and throwing it just as hard on the mound caught his eye. He saw great talent in this young man, and he knew in that moment he had a bright future ahead of him if he was willing to work hard. With nowhere to go, he sat, alongside his dog, in the bleachers to watch the game. Now, Sanaharu, like most boys in Japan, grew up loving pro ball. He and Tetsujo would listen to Giants games on the radio, and Sanaharu was even graced with his first of many trips to Karakuen Stadium on Tetsujo's dime. Those teams of Shigeru Chiba, Takehiko Besho, Tetsuharu Kawakami, and Wada Yonamine captivated him, and he soon developed his ultimate dream of playing with the Giants one day. Yonamine even gave the young O a thrill a few years earlier. He was the first big leaguer that O would ever meet, having waited patiently outside of Karakuen for the Giants to arrive in hopes of an autograph. The two met briefly. Yonamine was the first American to ever win an MVP in NPB, but as a bilingual Hawaiian, he had a leg up on most gaijin. He spoke to the young O very warmly, signed for him, and told him best of luck in his big league career. Little did he know that he and O would become teammates for Wally's final two years in a Giants uniform. But this big leaguer, watching him as a junior high schooler who would grow to become a legend of the game, would become his master, his teacher, his mentor, and his friend. At the time, Hiroshi Arakawa was a second-year outfielder for the Mainichio Ryans, entering the beginning of what would be his short prime. That year, he slashed 270, 341, 366 with five home runs, 21 doubles, 101 hits, and batting in 25 RBIs in 116 games for the Orions. By this point, the Lions had pretty firmly locked up the lead in Pacific League, fighting off the Hawks in the process. Arakawa's physical skills at baseball may have been lacking, but his baseball mind was matched by few who have ever lived. He was an ardent student of the game, and knew baseball inside and out. This, of course, would make him the excellent coach that he would turn out to be after his playing career wrapped up seven years later. For now, though, he was a big leaguer in his prime, easily recognized by most people on the street, including these boys on this baseball field tonight. Those on both teams were starstruck, and no one seemed to be brave enough to approach him. Arakawa kept his eyes on the young O, analyzing his pitching, his swing, and all of his tools appraising him like a sculpture, until he stood and approached Sadaharu as he stood on deck. The young ball player motioned for the teenager to lend him his ear. How come you don't hit and throw left-handed? He asked. Sadaharu's emotions ran roughshod over his mind. There were no thoughts that made any sense. Everything from happiness, anxiety, honor, frustration, the whole nine yards. All he could muster in response was, I don't know. Try it. Arakawa urged him, see if it works. Sadaharu O was dumbfounded. A big leaguer is asking me to make a fool of myself in front of both my teammates and my opponents. I can't do this. I never tried this before in my life. He has faith in me. I can't let him down. I can't let my team down. Guess I'll try it. Dutifully answering a command from someone who knew more than him about baseball, as anyone would. Sadaharu O stepped into the batter's box to the right of the plate for the first time. He fiddled with his footwork to make sure that he achieved the necessary balance to hit the ball hard. 
The bat came to rest on his left shoulder, and the joint lifted into the air. He lowered his right shoulder toward the plate. His eyes blinked a couple times to find his range, and at last, he was ready for the next pitch. The windup came. The ball was released. He unhinged his right hip, meeting the ball with his wrists, and... The ball sailed into the air, rocketing towards the right center field fence. It landed just shy of the warning track and bounced against the wall. He turned on the Jets, took a wide turn around first, and slid safely into second for a double. Breathing heavy, his mind finally calmed down. His teammates clapped and cheered as he politely nodded in thanks to each of them. He cast his eye back towards the bleachers at Arakawa, who smiled back at him, nodding in approval. With that, he turned to go and disappeared back into the shadows just as quickly as he appeared. Sanaharu hit and threw left-handed for the rest of the game, and every game following it to splendid results. And as he strode home from the game that night, he wondered what this ethereal visit of Hiroshi Arakawa meant for his future, and what else fortune had in store for him. Thank you for watching The King's Tale here on the Global Baseball Network. Please do like and share this video if you enjoyed it, and you know somebody who would enjoy it right along with you. And be sure to hit the subscribe button down below the video screen along with the bell icon to be notified every time we upload a new video, including part two of this very story. Remember, everything we do is to make sure you get your fix of the world's greatest game, and we love doing it. I've been Marshall Amert. This has been part one of The King's Tale here on the Global Baseball Network. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. But for now, that's the game.